you'll see Korea the way the soldiers saw it, in full, shocking color. This is a true picture of the war, full of terror, chaos, blood, and courage. Much of it has never been seen by the general public until now. This is Korea, the first great confrontation of the Cold War. In the spring of 1950, just two months before tensions between North and South Korea boiled over into war, a South Korean military photographer captured a mass execution on film. It is gruesome evidence of the simmering feud that would tear the Korean peninsula apart. These North Koreans were captured while spying on the South. These dead, once fellow countrymen, are now enemies to South Korea. The tensions between North and South, born in the wake of World War II, have reached the boiling point. Korea, called the land of the morning calm, is really a harsh land of jagged ridges, fickle weather, and a checkered past. The peninsula lies 6,000 miles east of the United States, in a remote corner of the Asian North Pacific. Sitting precariously between Russia, China, and Japan, Korea was always at the mercy of its bigger neighbors. For centuries, foreign conquerors trampled over Korean soil to do battle with each other. As World War II came to a close, the peninsula was up for grabs after decades of Japanese rule. In July of 1945, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin joined forces with the United States to pinch the Japanese out of Korea with a two-prong attack from north and south. The superpowers met at the 38th parallel, the line of latitude running through the middle of the peninsula. They agreed to split and occupy Korea along that line. The Soviets would control the northern half, while the U.S. took the southern half, each set to work honing a government modeled in its own image. When the superpowers pulled out in 1947, they left behind two starkly different regimes. In the north, zealous puppets of communist Russia and China took control. In the south, a Princeton-educated autocrat named Syngman Rhee emerged. Both sides wanted the other eliminated. Threats grew stronger, spies more numerous, and violence more prevalent along the border. This little peninsula wasn't big enough for both of them. But the 8th parallel, hoping to crush the South in one overwhelming offensive. 135,000 communists besieged a ragtag South Korean border patrol and steamrolled southward. At outposts all along the border, South Koreans and their American military advisors were overrun, caught completely off guard. The U.S. had deprived South Korea of weapons and ammunition, thinking it might invade the North and start war. Syngman Rhee, the South's fiery and aggressive leader, had threatened to do so. All that held him back was a lack of firepower. Now, the U.S. strategy of restraint had backfired. The South was on the receiving end, with nothing to defend itself against the communist tanks and heavy artillery. In just two days, Seoul, the South Korean capital lying 30 miles below the parallel, was captured by the North. Terrified South Koreans rushed to escape the city. Roads leading south over the Han River were jammed with refugees and truckloads of equipment. But in fear of the communist advance, southern officials ordered the bridges destroyed. When they exploded, hundreds of refugees were still struggling to cross. Nearly all of them perished. Thousands more were cut off from escape.
News of Seoul's collapse spread quickly through the countryside. Overnight, panic permeated the southern peninsula. North Korea hoped the U.S. would look the other way and let the South be taken. But the American home front was being whipped into a frenzy over communist aggression. If South Korea fell to the Reds, would Japan be next? Sensing public outrage, President Harry Truman immediately called for U.S. air and sea strikes against North Korean targets. Korea is a small country, thousands of miles away. But if what is happening there is important to every American. An act of aggression such as this creates a very real danger to the security of all free nations. This is a direct challenge to the efforts of free nations to build the kind of world in which men can live in freedom and peace. This challenge has been presented squarely. We must meet it squarely. American jets went right to work, shooting down six North Korean fighter planes on their first day in action. The Navy bombarded the enemy coastline from the sea. But the communists owned the land and they pushed on, virtually unfazed. There was speculation that the U.S. would use the atom bomb as it had on Japan, but Russia had deployed one successfully the previous summer, presenting a dangerous new threat. Dropping the bomb now would risk Armageddon, so it was clear to U.S. commanders that this war would have to be fought from the trenches. Truman called on the United Nations to lead a police action against North Korea. The prompt action of the United Nations to put down lawless aggression and a prompt response to this action by free peoples all over the world will stand as a landmark in mankind's long search for a rule of law among nations. United States forces would be the backbone of the operation. But the force of the U.S. military in 1950 was dangerously weak. Its budget was one-tenth what it had been in 1945, and combat troops in the Far East were few and far between. What strength was left was thousands of miles away, bolstering NATO forces against the Warsaw Pact nations in Eastern Europe. Douglas MacArthur, the commander-in-chief of Far East forces and a legendary World War II general, would face a great challenge as leader of operations. A supremely confident man with a larger-than-life presence, MacArthur was the face of America to the Asian world. His cherished military legacy would be put to the test in Korea. The first brigade to reach the front was Task Force Smith. Its reports confirmed the dangers that lay ahead. In early July, the brigade ran into a column of North Koreans 30 miles below Seoul. Waiting in a cluster of hills, the force hid motionless until the enemy was upon them, and then let loose with everything they had. But the northern tanks were undeterred. Task Force Smith only knocked out four, and the other 33 rolled right through its lines. For the first of many times in the war, the Americans were trapped behind the enemy and had to fight their way out. Guys fell around me as mortar rounds zeroed in on us. One of my young guys got it in the middle. Oh, Jesus, the guy was moaning and groaning. There wasn't much I could do but pat him on the head and say, hang in there. Lieutenant Philip Day, Jr., Task Force Smith. It quickly became clear that this was no police action. This was war. And unless support arrived in a hurry, it would be a short one. Troops from the U.S. 8th Army arrived from Japan over the next few weeks, but they were trying to stop a flood with their hands. The North Koreans were pushing steadily south toward Pusan, and UN troops faced a real possibility of being driven into the sea. The first American strategy was to dig in along the front and set up blockades. But time and again, 
the North Korean would move around them and block from the rear. Unit after unit was trapped in enemy territory. By July 20th, only a small corner of South Korea was left to conquer. The United Nations was losing the race against time. who didn't mince words. On July 29th, he issued a stand or die order. He told his subordinates, if I ever see you back here again, it had better be in a coffin. Walker's troops faced hostility no matter which way they turned. They had to rely on their only advantage, firepower, to keep them alive. Along the southwest shore of the perimeter, U.S. Marines headed off a hard communist charge. Overhead, Marine Corsairs tore up the enemy line, destroying vehicles and supply lines. But north of there, a U.S. Army battalion was being whipped apart. North Korean tanks rushed down from the hills and launched a concentrated attack from point-blank range. The Americans lost all of their equipment, suffered 160 casualties, and were quickly overrun. The battleground was nicknamed Bloody Gulch. Further upstream, the communists found a gap in the UN line and exploited it. During the night, they crossed the Naktang and easily captured No Name Ridge. The ridge ran straight south toward Pusan, and unless the North Koreans were driven back quickly, the whole perimeter could fall. The Americans struck back hard. For two weeks, the battle raged on. The same hills were won and lost dozens of times. Punch drunk infantrymen fought with everything they had. Air attacks rained down on the communists. After the firefight, the American airstrikes hit the North Koreans on either side of the river. The North Koreans were screaming. We heard them, and we were a mile or more away. Floyd Atkins, B Company. The river line was eventually restored, and the North Koreans fell back to lick their wounds. The red tide had been halted for the first time. By mid-August, the United Nations had built up enough manpower to level the playing field. Units arrived through the port of Pusan from nations as diverse as France, Turkey, Thailand, and Ethiopia. The British Commonwealth forces, drawing men from Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, were also important contributors. Most of these men were too young for World War II. They were eager to make their own mark on this new battlefield but few of them could comprehend the harsh realities of war that awaited them. American troops in particular showed a brash confidence coming off the boat. Pusan was like being in a college town a homecoming Saturday. The kids were terrific. They didn't walk off the dock, they swaggered off. <laughs> 
Their attitude said, don't worry about it, the Marines are here. Second Lieutenant Tom Gibson. Among those arriving were thousands of black recruits. Unlike their predecessors in previous war, they would serve in mixed units, fighting alongside white troops for the first time. And while most branches of the military still practiced segregation in 1950, the demand for fresh soldiers was immediate, and units were filled on a first-come, first-sent basis, regardless of race. Mixed units cooperated well on the hills of Korea, whether in the midst of combat or campfire sing-alongs. But on September 1st, 1950, all attention turned to the enemy, who launched a final offensive all around the wall of the perimeter. The communists limped forward with exhausted men and a broken supply line, but they were fought out and couldn't sustain the drive. Now they were losing the race against time. The moment was right for the United Nations to strike back, and General MacArthur knew just where to do it. For weeks, General MacArthur had been eyeing the port at Inchon for a counterstrike. Inchon was nestled along the shores of the Yellow Sea. It was the closest port to Seoul and a major supply center. But it was deep in enemy territory and laden with natural obstacles, such as the 33-foot shift between high and low tide, the largest in the world. To make matters worse, Air Force flyovers revealed that the islands in the harbor were guarded by North Korean troops. The hazards were tremendous. Naval commanders protested the plan, but MacArthur was adamant. He sent a telegram to the Pentagon on September 6th that read, There's no question in my mind as to the feasibility of the operation, and I regard its chance of success as excellent. I go further and believe that it represents the only hope of wresting the initiative from the enemy and thereby presenting the opportunity for a decisive blow. The loss of Incheon would be an immense psychological defeat for the North Koreans. Conversely, control of Incheon would give UN forces a tremendous boost in position and morale. It offered a secure beachhead from which to launch attacks on Kimpo Airfield and Seoul, 25 miles away. But the operation called for amphibious teams to land on a small beach, scale a seawall, and attack directly into a city. It would require soldiers of unparalleled bravery. MacArthur created a special 10th Corps to carry out the operation. Divisions from the Army, Marines, and Navy were pulled from the action around Pusan to lead the charge. As the soldiers set sail for Inchon, they reflected on what lay ahead. As soon as we pulled out of Pusan, we began to get the briefings on the tide situation in the Inchon harbor area. None of us ever had any experience operating under such tidal conditions before, let alone ever having been involved in an amphibious landing. As soon as the morning of September 15th approached, we realized that we had all the ingredients for a disaster on our hands. Ensign George Gilman, USS Mount McKinley. The invasion strategy was as complicated as its target. Inchon's harbor was too shallow, low tide for large ships to maneuver. So MacArthur decided to invade in two phases, synchronized with the high tides. Wolmi Do, the main island at the entrance to the harbor, would be assaulted with the first tide in the morning. The main event would follow with the second tide at night. Five days in advance of the operation, marine jets began blanketing Wolmi Do with bombs. Two days before, surface ships joined in. And so it was on the morning of September 15, 1950, the 10th Corps moved in on burned out Wolmi Do. The North Koreans had been caught off guard and gave up the island easily, suffering more than 300 casualties in the process. Only 20 American troops were injured. None were killed. 
For the next 11 hours, the 10th Corps infantry waited for the tide to roll back. While they rested, 230 vessels moved in, and Marine Corsairs ravaged the city of Incheon. Troops on Wolmi Do watched the air assault unfold. Reporter Jack Siegel was there to record the reaction. Yeah, what do you think of the Marine Corsairs? Now, those Marine Corsairs are pretty swell things to have around. Here comes another one of them down on the other side of that hill. Now, there go two rockets. <laughs> Look at that man. He went... The loss of Incheon put the North Koreans still fighting south of there in deep trouble. The UN invasion was completely unexpected, and most of the Red Army was still fighting in the Pusan perimeter area, 130 miles south. Communist troops there were never informed of the defeat at Incheon. They fought on for a week afterward, unaware that they were in danger of being cut off. But when word of Incheon finally trickled down to the perimeter, they fled northward almost immediately. Meanwhile, the 10th Corps marched northeast from Inshan on the road to Seoul. They were battle-ready and let nothing stand in their way. The first target inland was Kimpo Airfield. As the closest major airstrip to Seoul, its value was immeasurable. Kimpo fell easily to the Marines on September 18th. Within two days, Marine Corsairs were launching airstrikes on Seoul from there. Kimpo would play a key role in conquering the city. The 10th Corps had a three-pronged plan. The 5th Marines would cross the Han River directly north of Kimpo, and then swing east and attack the city's western flank. Meanwhile, the 1st Marines would capture the suburbs just south of Seoul and then join the 5th Marines to attack the city's west side. Finally, the Army 7th Division would rush up from the Pusan perimeter and cut off North Korean reinforcements on the eastern side. The Marines crossed the Han's plan, but hit strong resistance in the hills west of Seoul. Heavy fighting took its toll on the Marines. The North Koreans were dug in deep and stuck to the hills like glue. Tank fire and air support rained down on the communists for three days. Even flamethrowers couldn't loosen their hold. The battle came down to the last man, almost literally. On a crucial ridge known as Hill 66, Marines made a final push for control. The last men standing charged heroically with their bayonets and pried the communists from their foxholes. 
When the smoke cleared, just 33 of the company's 206 Marines stood to savor the victory. Southeast of the city, the Army 7th Infantry was blazing a trail, advancing north like a steam train. On September 22nd, it beat back an enemy tank battalion and captured another airfield at Suwon, 20 miles southeast of Seoul. Air missions from Suwon and Kimpo against Seoul helped clear the way for the soldiers below. By September 24th, UN troops held the high ground around the capital. I'll never forget the sight I saw. Down below was a very big city. Smoke was coming from everywhere. Buildings and houses were on fire. You could see the Corsairs dive down from the sky, then swoop back up, leaving a puff of black smoke and a dull explosion. From the top of that hill, it looked like I was watching a movie right before my eyes. Except that it was for real. John Bishop, Private First Class. The next day, the North Koreans fled the city. American soldiers rushed down from the hills in triumph. Seoul, the economic and cultural center of Korea, was back in friendly hands. On September 29, 1950, dignitaries flew into Kimpo and made their way to Seoul for a celebration. It was full of pomp and pageantry. The United Nations wanted the world to know that their police action was well in hand. But snipers could still be heard in the distance during the ceremony, an audible reminder of the dangers still lurking on the horizon. In September of 1950, the momentum was shifting dramatically in favor of the United Nations. The 8th Army was pushing northward at a pace that recalled Patton's drive across France after Normandy. The first objective was to reach the 38th parallel, where the war began, to reclaim South Korea's old borders. South Korean divisions led the charge, reaching the parallel on October 1st. They kept moving right into North Korea. A week later, American forces were perched at the parallel, anxiously waiting for orders to follow suit. But back in Washington, tough choices had to be made. Should the United Nations continue the drive into North Korean soil? Would this overstep the mandate of a police action? There were no easy answers. U.S. commanders heard rumors that communist China was moving large numbers of troops north into Manchuria. The Chinese resented American intervention in the region and feared that hostilities would spill over into their Manchurian territory. Intelligence reports estimated that up to 450,000 Chinese troops were lurking in the hills beyond the Yalu River, poised to strike. But these warning signs were cast aside by Americans, thirsting for an unconditional victory. After the World Wars, anything less would be a disappointment. Korea didn't affect the everyday lives of most Americans as previous wars had. 1950s America was a pleasant, peaceful place, where there was a car in every garage and a drive-in diner in every town. Stories of the triumphs in Korea were an exciting diversion from the humdrum every day, and as the 8th Army marched heroically onto North Korean soil, a bored, communist-hating populace watched with attentive glee. As the fighting moved north, the citizens of South Korea tried to resume their daily lives. Weddings, funerals, and the daily market went on as they had before the war. As they recovered from the destruction of the previous four months, they waited anxiously for their leader, Syngman Rhee, to deliver on his long-held promise to unite the peninsula. After centuries of subjugation, the Korean people were anxious to control their own destiny. 
Whether at the mercy of the Mongols, Chinese, Manchus, Russians, or Japanese, South Koreans were always in the shadow, and often under the command of foreign invaders. They were most influenced by the Chinese, who ruled the peninsula on and off for more than a thousand years. The cultures of the two countries, each centered around Buddhism and agriculture, were closely linked. But the politics of the two were worlds apart in 1950. South Koreans rejected the Chinese communism that threatened to devour their homeland. Within weeks, their sons would meet their nemesis head-on in the hills of North Korea. There, the front was opening up. The road to Pyongyang, the North Korean capital, was free and clear, and UN battalions raced each other to it. The North Koreans tried to establish a thin defensive line around their capital, but they couldn't curtail the UN momentum. The 8th Army found itself at the gates of Pyongyang within 10 days of crossing the parallel. Looking at the open road ahead, the men couldn't help being optimistic. General MacArthur announced that we would be home by Thanksgiving. We believed them. Life seemed good in Pyongyang. Morale was sky high. James Cardinal, Private First Class. The 8th Army set out north and west from Pyongyang, eager to vanquish the northern regime. As they crossed the Changchan River, the last major land barrier in North Korea, they could smell victory waiting for them on the other side. But what they found was a mass grave holding over 100 executed American prisoners. The North Koreans were turning even more savage in their desperation. UN resolve was renewed. On October 24th, General MacArthur ordered his men to march straight to the Yalu River. Now he would let nothing stand in the way of total victory. But just over the horizon, squatting silently in the hills, were hundreds of thousands of Chinese soldiers. On October 25, 1950, the silent fears of the United Nations were confirmed. The Chinese that had been quietly amassing between the UN forces and the Yalu River suddenly made their presence known. In the Central Mountains, thousands of American troops were ambushed and surrounded by a massive Chinese division. Entire battalions were caught off guard and decimated. Airdrops were all the support the UN soldiers had. They fought desperately in all directions, trying to make it out alive. Most of them didn't. As word of the massacre spread among the troops, their morale, which had been sky-high just hours before, dropped quickly. They said it sounded like Chinese. No one knew what the hell was going on. It was Halloween and colder than a witch. We waited and froze. It was very dark. Robert Harper, 19th Infantry. The Far East Command, already gearing up for a victory parade, still couldn't believe it was facing a full Chinese assault. Reports back to Washington claimed the attacks came from a small force assisting with the defense of the Yalu River, and nothing more. But General Walker was alarmed. He ordered all of his units, even those far from the attack, to pull back to the Changchun River and reevaluate the situation. Then, just as abruptly as the ambushes came, they ended. The Chinese faded back into the hills and waited. Throughout November, American surveillance planes tried to determine just how many Chinese were out there. Estimates counted between 50 and 70,000, a manageable number. But it turned out they missed another 250,000. The Chinese were incredibly adept at concealing themselves, 
They would keep still all day, camouflaged under helmets covered with brush. To planes flying overhead, heavily occupied areas often looked like empty landscape. Most of November passed quietly, and UN troops held out hope that they'd make it home for Christmas. Assured by the silence, General MacArthur ordered a cautious advance on November 24th. In the west, the 8th Army would head for the Yalu as a unified front, hoping to prevent any single battalion from being caught out on a limb. In the east, the 10th Corps was ordered to make a major advance around the Chosun Reservoir. The first day of the offensive was encouraging. Modest gains were made all along the line. But then, on November 25th, the war suddenly turned upside down. The Chinese found a vulnerable gap between the 8th Army and the 10th Corps in the Central Mountains. They struck there with all their might. The entire UN line was split in two. Three days into a renewed offensive, the UN force found itself in a full-scale retreat. The UN's lines, as well as its spirits, were broken. And with the attack came the North Korean winter, an enemy that would prove every bit as merciless as the communists. By late November of 1950, the United Nations forces were fighting for their lives. The police action that was supposed to produce fast results and total victory had managed to lure opposition from the world's most populous adversary, China. As the front to its west was crumbling, the 10th Corps faced a mounting challenge along the Chosun Reservoir. The Chosun lay high in North Korean mountain country. By late November, the cold there was blistering. The temperature fell as low as 40 below zero, and 50 mile an hour winds made it feel even colder. Everything the troops touched turned to ice, engine oil, gun breaches, morphine, and even their own hands and feet. The ground was so frozen that digging a foxhole was out of the question. One pastime to keep the blood flowing was a friendly snowball fight. This was certainly not the ideal place to spend Thanksgiving, but the troops made the best of it. For Thanksgiving, we were all served turkey and all the things that go with it. You had to eat fast because everything was turning cold. The gravy and then the mashed potatoes froze first. Boy, you ate fast. And all the time, the snipers were shooting at us. William Davis, hospitalman. Siberian weather and enemy insurgents had taken their toll on the troops. The men had worn the same clothes for weeks, and good meals were few and far between. Troops hardly slept in the sub-zero cold. But in true marine fashion, they pulled themselves together and prepared to mount an offensive on November 27th. The soldiers were bracing for the worst, having heard the reports of Chinese overwhelming units to the west. The objective was to move around the western side of the Chosun and head north toward Kangye, where the North Korean government was hiding. UN troops were concentrated in four positions. The front line lay at Yudamni, where Marine regiments were preparing to lead the charge. South of there, 3,000 U.S. Marines were stationed at the base of the reservoir. Down at Koto Ri were 4,200 men, including some Army infantry and British Marines. On the east side of the reservoir stood another 2,500 GIs. Supply lines to these troops were in severe jeopardy, since units below them were already retreating to ports along the coast. But they were ordered to press on alone. To keep the supplies coming, they relied on one of the newest machines of war, the helicopter, 
Choppers first appeared in World War II, but improvements to their design and stability made them indispensable in Korea, especially during that Arctic winter when ground transport was next to impossible. On the western shore of the Chosin, the Marines crept forward from Yu Ni and found a solid wall of Chinese waiting for them. Immediately, strategy shifted from offense to defense, and the regiment fell back to the village to brace for an attack. It wasn't long in coming. On November 28, 1950, six Chinese divisions descended on Yu Ni. For three days, the battle raged. The Marines unleashed their entire arsenal on the Communists. The Marine Air Wing flew bombing runs from carriers out in the Sea of Japan. But it wasn't enough. The Chinese had them surrounded. If these men were going to make it out alive, they would have to fight every step of the way. Their commander, Oliver P. Smith, offered some famous words of encouragement. Gentlemen, we are not retreating. We are merely attacking in another direction. Across the Chosun to the east, an even greater disaster was unfolding. The Army 7th Division was cut off on a 4,000-foot plateau, surrounded and vulnerable. Anywhere it turned, it would face a vicious fight. Some soldiers went AWOL, off into the hills or onto the ice of the reservoir, hoping to escape the trap. A special task force was created to bore a hole through the Chinese and back to friendly lines. Task Force Faith took only enough trucks to carry the wounded and destroyed all the weapons it couldn't carry. It set out on December 1st. Enemy fire came from all sides. As if this wasn't enough to contend with, friendly napalm fell a little too close for comfort. The two lead companies were shelled by planes flying close air support. The task force came upon a village swarming with communists and was completely blocked. There was no option but to advance directly through the Chinese blockade. 2,500 GIs entered the town. Only a thousand made it through. Those that could dragged their fallen buddies with them. After 13 days of hell, Task Force Faith finally made it to safe ground. The campaign along the frozen Chosen has become legendary in modern war history. Rarely, if ever, was the cold more blistering, the enemy more unmerciful, or the escape more precarious. And the men who served there are joined forever in a brotherhood known as the Chosen Few. General MacArthur watched from a distance as his forces crumbled in November 1950. Korea would be his final crusade, and a resounding victory there would have assured his immortality. But that victory, imminent just days ago, was slipping away. His frustration was immeasurable, and most of it was directed at the Truman administration. Truman had limited MacArthur's resources to prevent him from attacking China. He imposed airspace restrictions that forbade U.S. fighters from chasing Chinese planes beyond the Korean border, and he limited the amount of manpower and equipment that was sent to the front. MacArthur found these restraints crippling. On November 28th, he sent a message of warning to the Pentagon. We face an entirely new war. Our present strength of force is not sufficient to meet this undeclared war by the Chinese. This command has done everything humanly possible within its capabilities, but now is faced with conditions beyond its control and its strength. General MacArthur, 
The relationship between the president and his general, never entirely cooperative, was disintegrating as quickly as the UN's field position. Like its advance two months earlier, the UN's retreat gathered momentum as it went. The mass exodus of soldiers was eclipsed only by that of petrified North Korean civilians. Thousands were eager to defect. Their restlessness may have been inspired by UN-sponsored leaflets like these that were airdropped over North Korean villages. The leaflets warned of the dangers of communism and touted the freedom of Western ideals. Disgruntled with their treatment in North Korea, thousands fled south. Meanwhile, the Chinese charge continued. As Christmas approached, UN morale was desperately low. The men resented the limitations being imposed by Washington. Their complaint, which would be echoed 15 years later in another Asian conflict, was that they weren't being allowed to use their superior force to win the war. They, like their general, thought that if they only had better support, they could have spent Christmas in Kalamazoo instead of Korea. To make matters worse, two days before Christmas, their field commander, General Walker, was killed in a jeep accident. The fearless leader, who'd once told his troops, if I ever see you back here, it had better be in a coffin, would go home in one himself. Walker's successor was Matthew B. Ridgway, a proven leader who understood MacArthur's zest for conquest and Washington's wavering enthusiasm. He'd served in both climates. In World War II, he commanded an airborne division over Italy. Later, he served at the Pentagon. His level-headed wisdom brought a vital balance to the battlefield. When he arrived at the front, Ridgway was startled by the somber mood. He wrote to a colleague. It was clear to me that our troops had lost confidence. I could read it in their eyes, in their walk. I could read it in the faces of their leaders, from sergeants right on up to the top. There was a complete lack of that alertness, that aggressiveness that you find in troops whose spirits are high. General Ridgway. The Chinese onslaught only added to their misery. By New Year's Eve, the Red Army had crossed the 38th parallel and was closing in on Seoul. Ridgway ordered a retreat back to the Han River, except for an arc around Seoul. There, his troops were clinging to the northern fringes of the city. But they couldn't hold out for long. Seven Chinese armies were stampeding straight for Seoul. And once again, the UN was overwhelmed. On January 3rd, Seoul fell for the second time, and by the next day, the UN line had dropped 35 miles south of the capital, well below the Han River. The troops were almost back to square one. In the four months since they'd last been here, all they'd gained were casualties. Luckily, breakthroughs in war medicine were keeping many of those casualties alive. What many people think of when the Korean War is mentioned is a wild group of TV characters with names like Hawkeye, BJ, and Hot Lips. But unlike their TV counterparts, the real troops who served in Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals, known as MASH units, couldn't leave the set at the end of the day. They witnessed every cruelty war could offer in graphic detail, day in and day out, around the clock. During the war, the men and women of MASH were the backbone of successful field operations. MASH units made their debut in Korea. Each was a complete life-saving system that could operate close to the front lines and shift position at a moment's notice. Never before was war medicine so close to the war. Here it is two and a half hours after this man was wounded and he's lying fairly comfortably now, I would say, in the hospital. How many miles behind the lines is this? It's about 10 miles 
This uh, mash is right on the 38th parallel. Right on the 38th yeah. parallel. The surgery is on uh, in North Korea, and this where you're now in South Korea. Surgery is in North Korea, and uh, the pre-op room is in South Korea. Each unit was equipped with a helicopter fleet for air rescue, paramedics, and cutting-edge medical technology. But the basic function of a MASH unit was known as meatball surgery. Doctors did whatever they could to keep a soldier stable until he could be airlifted to a full-scale hospital, further behind the lines or even offshore. Rescue teams adhered to the golden hour rule. They made sure every wounded soldier was carried from the battlefield to a MASH unit in under one hour. The teams relied on road and rail lines where they could. But in the craggy terrain of Korea, airlift by helicopter was usually the best rescue option. The teamwork of helicopter paramedics and MASH doctors saved thousands of lives. Medical teams in Korea saved 25% more wounded than they had in World War II. They became the inspiration for the rescue teams in Vietnam and the Persian Gulf. Well, now over here we see them starting to carry the patient to the to the x-ray room. Oh, but what's going to happen now? He's going to x-ray his leg, left leg. What's your name? Green, Bobby Green. Are you a medical corpsman? Uh, I'm a medical technician. Technician, I see. Oh, will he be back in just a few minutes? He'll be back as soon as they x-ray him. Boy, things really happen when they bring a patient into a match, don't they? It takes around 30 minutes to get him in the room when we get him. Between battles, life for MASH doctors occasionally resembled the lives of their TV counterparts. Women served alongside men. Back then, it was the closest they could get to the front lines. Once the front settled down in late 1951, volleyball courts appeared at MASH units. Games helped to pass endless hours of waiting. But when the wounded suddenly flooded in, medics had to be ready for action. Some MASH veterans remember performing surgery for up to 80 straight hours. These doctors would do more operations in three days than they had in a year of private practice back home. And the rules of medicine were quite different with casualties of war. We were concerned only with getting the kid out of here alive enough for someone else to reconstruct him. Up to a point, we were concerned with fingers, hands, arms, and legs. But sometimes we deliberately sacrificed a leg to save a life. We may lose a leg because if we spend an extra hour trying to save it, another guy would die waiting. Dr. Richard Hooker. MASH rescue operations were like a well-oiled machine. They were a vital part of keeping UN lines stacked with able-bodied men. After being patched up, the more critical patients boarded another helicopter bound for a permanent hospital. Those less seriously injured went back to the front to fight. With the Chinese attacking that front from all angles, UN forces needed every soldier it could get. By January of 1951, the Chinese had pushed United Nations forces back to the drawing board with a frightening display of manpower. But they were quickly running out of steam. They were overextended and in dire need of supplies. They wouldn't be able to sustain an offensive much longer. Commander Ridgway was confident the days of retreat would soon be over. I find it difficult to understand the motives of the Chinese communist leaders in continuing their aggression. Surely by now it must be clear to them, beyond any shadow of doubt, that they are incapable, with their own resources, of destroying the United Nations forces in Korea, or of driving them into the sea, as they continue to boast they will. The general launched a task force named Operation Wolfhound to investigate the communist weakness. It set out north in the direction of Seoul. The team made it all the way to Suwon, halfway back to the capital, before it found any strong Chinese force. Air Force pilots overhead reported that the enemy was moving north instead of south. 
the abrupt turnaround was mysterious. Ridgway decided the time was right for a full-scale offensive. He commissioned an operation designed to push the Chinese back to Seoul and beyond. On January 25th, Operation Thunderbolt was unleashed. The troops charged forward and sent the communists scrambling for cover. Within days, they recaptured Incheon and Kimpo airfield, taking both without a struggle. By February, the men found themselves looking triumphantly across the Han at Seoul, as they had five months earlier. No one could explain the sudden reversal of fortune, but General Ridgway was determined to do all he could to exploit it. His battle strategy recalled Napoleon's famous command, Never mind towns, bring me prisoners. Ridgway was more concerned with destroying the Chinese army than with regaining territory. Under his watch, Korea would become a showdown between expendable UN firepower and expendable Chinese manpower. But neither could compete with the wrath of Mother Nature. In February, mud from heavy rains blanketed Central Korea. Both sides were stuck in the quagmire. The weather stalled the UN advance, but the Chinese were crippled by it. Their supply lines were racked from above. 